Some people see a dumpster fire and do nothing but watch the spectacle. Some are too scared to face the danger. Or they think it will benefit them if they just let it keep on burning. Others shrug and say, Oh, all this talk of a dumpster fire, it's just fake news. There is an inferno raging. It is worth taking into consideration that it is not just a matter of looking at each individual character arc within the Disney trilogy. The character arc of each character interweaves with the other characters. This helps to mold the bonds between characters. People in the real world have to work with others in their lives, and so they naturally respond to seeing this dynamic in stories. In Star Wars A New Hope, Princess Leia is in a position of requiring the help of Luke and Han in escaping the Death Star. This is a play on the trope of the princess in the tower, the twist though is that Leia is an active participant in her rescue rather than as a passive participant. At the climax of the first film, Luke requires Han's help to heroically fulfill his mission in destroying the Death Star. In Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, Luke is at a very low ebb after his defeat by Vader and the personal news of Vader being his father. He ends up requiring Leia to help pick him up and rescue him. In Star Wars Return of the Jedi Han Solo requires rescuing by Leia and Luke. People understand this is a matter of friendship. People in life have their downs where they require lifting up by friends. No one considers it as undermining or patronizing to their characters that they are in this position. Contrast this to Rey in the Disney trilogy. Where it is at the point that not only is she overpowered in her abilities, but the dynamic of situations where she would have been helped and rescued is twisted around so that she doesn't appear to be assisted. To the point where it has a knock-on impact on other characters. For example common sense would have had Han and Chewbacca on the surface of Jakku but instead we just have Rey escape herself with Finn. This means that Han had been without the Millennium Falcon for some time. As we will discuss in the individual character arc this is part of his emasculation. As to the question why the films may be going out of their way to not only miswrite a lot of the male characters in particular. But make a point of undermining. Emasculating and pushing them into the dirt before killing them. Consider the place that Star Wars has in American and Western mythology. And then consider the point about the process of demoralization that occurs as part of a societal Marxist subversion process as expressed by Ibas Menov. Subversion is the term, if, if you look in a, in a dictionary or criminal code to that matter, usually is, ex, is explained as a part of activity to destroy things like uh, religion, government, system, political, eco economical system of a country. And usually it's linked to espionage and such romantic things as blowing up bridges, sidetracking trains, um, clock and dagger activity in Hollywood style. Uh, when what I'm going to talk about now has absolutely nothing to do with the cliché of espionage or KGB activity of collecting information. So the greatest mistake or mis mis misconception, I think, is that uh, whenever we are talking about KGB for some strange reason, uh, starting from Hollywood movie makers to professors of political science, and quote-unquote experts on, on Soviet affairs or Kremlinologists as they call themselves, they think that the most desirable thing for Andropov and the whole KGB is to steal blueprints of some supersonic jet, bring it back to Soviet Union and sell it to the Soviet military industrial complex. This is only partly true. If, if, if we take <clears throat> the whole time money and manpower that the Soviet Union and KGB in particular spends outside of USSR border, we 
will discover, of course there are no official statistics unlike with CIA or FBI, that the espionage as such occupies only 10 to 15 percent of money, time, and manpower. 15 percent of the activity of KGB. The rest 85 percent is always subversion. No, subverter is a student who comes for exchange, a diplomat, an actor, an artist, a journalist like myself was 10 years ago. Now, subversion <clears throat> is an activity which is a two-way traffic. You cannot subvert an enemy which doesn't want to be subverted. What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. It says for itself what it is. It takes from, um, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why, why 15 or 20 years? This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation, one lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing or by various methods, infiltration, uh, propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. <laughs> of various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped, religion, educational system, social life, administration, law enforcement system, military, of course, and labor and employer relations, economy, okay? Five areas. Artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never. As a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such groups is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, pay, they, they, they have so much power? Almost monopolistic power on your mind. They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they are... They have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, President and, and his administration. Who the hell are they? Uh, Spiro Agnew, who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity. In a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you're better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling to the camera and do your job. <laughs> That's it. No more, no more competition. <laughs> Power structure slowly uh, is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power. And yet they do have power. Okay. Some idiots are saying it's actually good because it subverts our expectations. So yeah, after this movie came out, a bunch of people who thought they were much smarter than they actually are wrote a bunch of articles about how the movie is good because it subverts our expectations. Which is a stupid way of saying it's unpredictable. Then I'm sorry, you're an idiot. Number three, believe women. 
This purple-haired lady is Holdo, who looks like she's about to hold an intersectional lecture on modern Afrocentric feminism rather than command a fleet of rebel soldiers, but Leia gets knocked the f*** out, so the liberal arts major is up to bat. Now, real quick, I want to make it clear that this is not an attack on diversity. Space is a real big place, and it makes sense that it's populated by more than just weirdo aliens, a bunch of white people, and one black guy. That being said, Ryan Johnson's attempt to inject feminism into Star Wars has backfired horribly, and here's why. Now, first of all, this character obviously should have been Admiral Akbar or Mon Mothma or someone the audience actually has an emotional connection to, but okay, we're stuck with the lesbian bookstore owner. The real problem, however, is Holdo's bafflingly idiotic decision to have a special secret plan for no reason whatsoever. Tell us that we have a plan. Even when Poe threatens mutiny and takes Holdo prisoner, all she says is, Oh, uh, well, okay, not much I can do about that. Guess you're in charge now, Popo. No! All she needs to do in that moment is say to Poe, listen, mother let's sit on down, we'll have some green milk, and I will tell you about the secret plan so you stop trying to commit high treason. Now, here's the thing. What is the moral of the flawed interactions between Holdo and Poe? The most obvious moral is to be subservient to authority and blindly trust your superiors. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like something the bad guys would say. I wonder if a bunch of people just carrying out orders ever resulted in something bad. Oh yeah. However, the real moral is the ultimate exercise in jamming politically correct politics into a kid's movie with all the subtle nuance of a bad guy literally named General Grievous. See, Poe thinks he's a better leader than Holdo because he's a man. So he starts mansplaining. And look at this mansplaining, such a mansplainer. But what he really should have done is trust women. You know, no matter what, it doesn't matter what the situation. Even if it seems like that particular woman is about to get you and everyone you love incinerated by a million lasers, just trust her. She knows what's best. She is living her truth. Hashtag me too. Hashtag time's up. In summary, an assortment of differently colored people holding hands under a rainbow. Awesome. I'm totally down with that. Everybody getting killed because they didn't trust women enough. Dumpster fire. Luke. Where to start? The besmirching of Luke's character began in The Force Awakens. Put up as a sideshow hiding out on some secret location and not involved prominently in the galaxy at all. The implication in Han Solo is telling Rey about how mythical stories of the Rebellion and the Force are all true was that Luke had failed to rejuvenate the Jedi Order and the light side of the Force in the New Republic era. At the end of Episode 6 Luke had redeemed his father at the last and seen the Emperor destroyed. Luke had completed his training as per Yoda's instructions and so the way was open for him to be build a new Jedi Order. This also opened up the vacuum for the Rebellion to evolve into forming a new Republic with governance control over sizable sections of the galaxy. And to take on what can either be termed as defectors or simply military personnel who believed in the same vision as New Republic leaders. Instead we get a New Republic as a sideshow and focuses on the so-called Resistance instead. In The Last Jedi, the disappointment of him being turned into a miserable hobo railing against the Jedi and wanting to burn Jedi texts is well documented. As is the point of making him look like a fool through having him drink green sea giraffe breast milk. Turning him into a form of creepy uncle sneaking into his nephew's room with an erect lightsaber. And of course having the female protagonist rail against him being a disappointment while pushing him into the dirt. This is in the same film where Poe the heroic pilot was being put down by Admiral Gender Studies. And Finn being zapped by a mechanic. A bit of a clear pattern seems apparent. Vision. Luke's proper arc should have been to fulfill Anakin's potential, just as Leia should fulfill Padme. And so Luke would have had powers similar to what Anakin's would have been should he have remained fully organic. Now we're moving on to his Force powers. Since Luke Skywalker was the son of Anakin Skywalker, aka the Chosen One, he inherited immense levels of strength in the Force, enough so to even rival his father. Simply said, he had the Force potential of the Chosen One, which was one of the most powerful beings in the galaxy. One of his most used Force powers was Force Speed, which greatly increased his skill in lightsaber combat, and as said earlier, seemed as he was wielding 30 lightsabers at the same time when he was in battle. 
To him it seemed as if the time had slowed down considerably and allowed him to fight with dramatically enhanced reflexes. Luke's skill with telekinesis was simply overwhelming, such as one time when a massive food fight erupted at the Jedi Paroxium's mess hall and he instantly froze everything solid and liquid as if time had stopped. At one point, before knocking down an AT-AT walker by pressing against it with a force, he absorbed cannon blasts from it, as well as deflected the rest with his lightsaber. I think it would have been a nice touch for Luke to display what is known as battle meditation to illustrate the impact he has on those around him. Being publicly married to Mara Jade can be considered a good actualization of what Anakin should have done with Padme. While the greater debate around his arc should have focused on whether a centralized order centralized Jedi order is best. There is an issue of using power responsibly that could have been explored through his arc. In terms of having the legacy of his father somewhat overshadow him Darth Vader used his power to bully. Anakin Skywalker was rather more inspirational and led from the front. This would have tied in nicely to the issue of having to form a new Jedi Council in the sequel trilogy to give the power of the Jedi some focus and aim. While taking care to avoid the issue of centralization creep and the corruption of institutional politics. On a side note, taking on Rey as an apprentice on the basis she was a Kenobi would have been a nice touch too as a kind of role reversal of what occurred in the original film. Dumpster fire! Leia. There is some irony in Disney wanting to over-elevate her character but in doing so they have inadvertently made her a joke and a laughing stock. It's not just the flying layer scene though. There is also the issue that despite of being prominent politically in the original trilogy she has been turned into the leader of the so-called resistance. Far leftists seem to glorify their so-called progressive activism and think vigilante groups like Antifa are actually noble as opposed to being a tool of destabilization for certain interest groups. The moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure whether it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, but there's no division between evil and good, when even the Leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in the countries like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia. And we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninists, that is my former colleagues from Novosti Press Agency. Okay, so we reach that point. The next step is destabilization. Again, this word says for itself what it is. To destabilize all the relations, all the accepted institutions and organizations in a country of your enemy. How you do it? You don't have to send up a battalion of KGB agents to blow up bridges, no. You let them do it themselves. The area of application is, again, it's, it's, it's narrower now. Not like the, the previous case. The overt legitimate actions of the, of the KGB in this case would be ha hardly noticeable. There is no crime if a professor who recently went to USSR introduces a course of Marxism-Leninism in, in a, a, a Californian college, for example. Nobody is going to, to come to his doorstep and say, okay, Mister, come, you are under arrest. No, it's not a crime. It's not even considered a moral crime against your country. So the area of application here is narrowing down to ec economy, again, labor relations, right? To law and order, plus military. And uh, economy, law and order, Yes, and again, the uh, media, but uh, wider scope, a little bit different, I I'll explain later. Okay, basically, three areas. And so Leia has become a projection of this. And their idea of women being ma. The combat heroes is apparently empowerment. When we look at it closely though, they actually turned Leia into the leader of a mere vigilante militia who played no significant role in building the new republic. 
They do not seem to appreciate the irony that this is the same as what they did to Luke Skywalker who they are trying to undermine. Just as Luke Skywalker played no role in building a new lasting Jedi Order. And so Leia has no role in determining the nature of how political institutions of the future, post Endor, worked. This is disappointing as it effectively means no one has honored or continued Padm's work. That said even if the so-called diverse story group did attempt this, they would have messed it up anyway. As the sideshow of Rose Tico being a Greenpeace activist and animals smashing up a casino which is simplistically tied to capitalism. It would merely be far-left political policies she would have been pushing. Rather than what she was focused upon in A New Hope and Senator Amidala which was the overreach of the executive branch in relation to the Senate and appointment of governors in place of elections in the case of the latter. Vision. Have her start as Queen of Naboo, a base of support in certain areas and has some leverage as Padma's daughter, but her struggle is one of her accepting being Vader's daughter. There's the issue of also being Anakin's daughter who did have some positive legacy. Anakin did become a force ghost. And because Leia was force sensitive, he was able to contact her through that means instead. So he did just that, appearing as a force spirit to Leia shortly after the Battle of Endor. She, f she then asked who he was and what he was doing there in her room. The force spirit turned and told her not to fear him, revealing to her that he was her father, Anakin Skywalker. Upon hearing those words, Leia whispered Vader to herself, and had a chill go down her spine, and her hatred for him began to rise up. Noticing Leia's anger start to swell within her, Anakin told her that he was forgiven, and that he wished to make amends with her, and that she must be careful with her anger as that could lead to the dark side. Leia ignored his comments and simply told him that she wanted him to leave her at once. Anakin told her to wait, explaining to her that he was no longer the man she used to fear, but rather a stranger asking to be forgiven and hoping to be given a second chance. Leia then got angry and yelled at him, telling him that he can't ever restore Alderaan her home, or bring back Bail Organa, who she told him she would always consider to be her true father, that he can't ever bring back all the people he killed, or remove all the suffering he caused in the galaxy. Anakin paused, telling her that he strengthened the rebellion with what he did. He then walked back on his comments, going on to say that he may never be able to come back to her as a force spirit, and that this may be the last time she'll ever be able to see him. Good, was all Leia said in response to hearing that she may never see him again. Anakin then pleaded with her to forgive him, as Luke had done after he was saved. But Leia didn't want to hear it, telling him that she was not Luke, and that the galaxy had only played a cruel, dark trick on her, by making her related to the former Dark Lord. Anakin continued to ask for forgiveness, to which Leia finally responded that she could almost forgive him for torturing her on the Death Star all those years ago or even causing harm onto other people as that drove them to the Rebel Alliance, but that she would never forgive him for torturing Han Solo back on Cloud City. The sequel trilogy could have focused on her getting to grips with what the original trilogy focused on Luke getting to grips with. E.g. she grows into more influence as she learns to not only accept but embrace being Leia Skywalker as opposed to Leia Organa. She grows as she embraces her true self and have her take Anakin's lightsaber. As she does this she is able to redeem Kyle Ren again as Ben Solo and hand him Anakin's lightsaber as he embraces the light side. In terms of force training, there would be some sense to having her as an excellent shot with a blaster pistol. She is legolas to Luke Saragorn to distinguish them. Additionally, we can understand that being strong in the force means there is some raw ability. Like how Anakin was an effective pod racer and Luke an effective pilot. Leia has shown excellent ability to resist mind probes and torture. Additionally she knew instinctively that they were allowed to escape the Death Star. So then, trained force abilities should have evolved around high caliber force trick ability. Also, premonition ability, e.g. like Anakin's dreams. This would have made her excellent for picking up on the agendas and traps of her political opponents. Her arc should have culminated in fulfilling Padm's path as started in episode 1 to 2. And rising to Supreme Chancellor of a United Galaxy. This is to say that while Palpatine used their home planet as a means to an end. 
As Palpatine climbed in the ranks, Padme Amidala moved from being focused on local politics to intergalactic politics after learning about the nature of its corruption in Episode 1. This somewhat culminated in her being a major oppositional figure to Palpatine's power grab in Episode 3. Princess Leia somewhat continues this in the original film through her opposition to Grand Moff Tarkin. Episode 6 shows her having the common touch with her interaction with the teddy bear Ewoks. Continuing this then would see her fulfill Padme's trajectory and culminate in taking the office of Chancellor of the New Republic. And presiding over a united galaxy having placated separate Easter and other opponents. Dumpster fire! Han. Initially went over my head how bad he was treated. As many have mentioned, he is emasculated by having his beloved car taken off him. Then having Ray take it and start up staging him on his own ship through piloting skills and bypassing the compressor. Then there is the fact they turned him into a deadbeat dad. Like Luke he is actually in a regressed state from a new hope as he doesn't even have his ship. Vision. Have him as an admiral in charge of Leia's military fleet, doing his last covert mission via the Falcon and killed as Harrison Ford had recognizably wanted. Lando, Chewie. We are waiting on Lando's portrayal, but like everyone else like Ben Solo with Anakin's lightsaber, Chewbacca has had his inheritance of the Millennium Falcon taken off her and given to Rey. Vision. Have Lando in charge of Leia's infantry. Dumpster fire! Ray. The issues with Ray's personal character development arc is well documented at this point. While it could be understandable that someone working as a scavenger could have a proficient understanding of a ship's systems in order to identify which parts are valuable. And so know how to fix or get an idea of fast workarounds. There is the hard to believe fact that Ray was using abilities she wouldn't have even known existed not long after hearing about the Force. Added to that that even taking into account she would have some degree of street smarts and staff fighting ability. Having her out force grab a highly trained force user and then defeat him in a lightsaber duel. All causes suspension of disbelief to be broken. The greater issue though is the question as to who the parents who left her and weren't coming back were. Which was set up as a question of relevance in The Force Awakens versus the nobodies who sold her for drinking money in The Last Jedi. Overall though, there is a sense that Disney have misunderstood what makes Star Wars tick. Two is hard to escape the sense that they are treating Force sensitivity as an X-Men style mutant gene where powers just magically wake during puberty and don't require any training. Vision. The idea that Palpatine was the one who quote created Anakin doesn't really hold up when looked at more closely. When watching episode 1 and the prequels there was a sense that Anakin was conceived by the Force and this is what holds up. Consider, I. F. Palpatine creates Anakin, how does he ensure Kegon and co land on Tatooine with Padme? This also means that by plucking Anakin out of obscurity Kegon is inadvertently doing the work of the dark side and so forth. What does hold up? is that in response to the midochlorian experiments by Plagueis, the Force, or the Wills, created Anakin. It is then a matter of Palpatine's machinations leading to the Trade Federation blockade of Naboo but of course the Force so to speak involving itself. In that it guides Kegon and Queen Amidala out into the obscure Tatooine to bring a teacher into Anakin's orbit, initially Kegon and then Obi-Wan. What does make sense is as Obi-Wan is picking up on a phantom agenda occurring in the background at the start of episode 1. The Jedi are blind to this. The reverse can also be true. The Force or rather the Wills could have been manifesting their own phantom agenda that Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious were unaware of. This would occur as a response to Darth Plagueis experiments and be the reason for Force ghosts coming into being. Starting with Kigon Jin. It makes sense then that Palpatine would only notice Anakin at the end of episode 1 and that he will devise machinations to meddle in his training and bumping into a good prospect with whom to replace Darth Maul with. This is a topic for another video but it holds up with following the death of Padme and transition of Anakin into Vader.
just as the Jedi had been blind before and so the Emperor in turn was blind to Luke and Leia. While noticing Luke when tuning into an event as momentous as the Death Star. In Episode 6 that Sidious slash Palpatine could not detect Luke on the freighter but it is Darth Vader who does. What does make sense with respect to the Palpatine slash Sidious create Sanakin theory is that Palpatine may attempt to try something similar. Not being aware of Luke and also observing that Vader was unable to meet Anakin's potential. Sidious would likely seek to replicate what occurred with Anakin, it's a form of bastardization of what the Force did. Additionally, Sidious may have become aware of Force ghosts beginning to exist if he had become aware of Obi-Wan's disappearing act when Vader killed him. And if he had been able to tune in as it were to the Death Star destruction event. He may have been aware of quasi-Force ghost Obi-Wan's interference with Luke. Use the Force, Luke. Putting aside the perspective that Force Ghost may have started coming into being from Kegon onwards. Kegon dies at about the same time as Plagueis. This being done as a Force slash Wills means to deal with Force Ghost Plagueis or rather a Plagueis like Stargate Anubis who is in between. So then Sidious slash Palpatine would be aware the ability of Force Ghosts exists. And while Sith can't become Force Ghosts. Palpatine slash Sidious may want to also replicate that experience as a form of fail-safe. Which is what Jakku was so from this perspective Ray being from Jakku make s some sort of sense. In this sense Ray could have been created as someone not only as a prospective new apprentice but also for Palpatine to parasitically latch onto. Alice something of an insurance policy in the event of death but one that requires a living anchor. There is a fascinating theory Palpatine did apparently kill Padme to save Vader so he has some ability. In this sense it doesn't diminish from Vader's actions as Palpatine is dead but there is an extra layer to finishing Palpatine off for good. This could go some way to explaining or having Rey as a high powered protagonist. If Palpatine's force ghost is acting through her a bit like stem in the film Upgrade. I am the Senate. <laughs> can also be descended from Obi-Wan. There is a fascinating theory revolving around the Clone Wars era ruler of Mandala. The Duchess Satine. Satine has a history with Obi-Wan that predates Episode 1. She also has a nephew who she is close to called Corky Kriz. There's a theory about him actually being the son of Satine and Obi-Wan. Having him be Rey's father would have made some sense. And being the donor of choice in Palpatine's twisted insurance experiment would have worked for the sequel trilogy. Doing this is not only part of being from a strong force bloodline as required by the experiment if Palpatine wanted a good channel for the force. But is a good mind screw in the case of Palpatine as it articulates on the rivalry between Sidious and Obi-Wan Kenobi that began in episode 1 where. Obi-Wan is immediately able to pick up on the phantom agenda being perpetuated by Darth Sidious. Obi-Wan kills Darth Maul. An apprentice he had put time into training. Additionally we see he wants Anakin to leave Obi-Wan for dead after the Dooku fight but Anakin won't leave without him. There is also a question as to whether Sidious is actually giving Count Dooku a form of force boost as Obi-Wan is about to engage Count Dooku. Either way the preceding comment about Sith Lords being our specialty would no doubt have irritated Darth Sidious. And so having Rey be descended from both is a good way to articulate the background rivalry between Obi-Wan and Palpatine. A good prop to balance out Palpatine lies in Rey acquiring Obi-Wan's lightsaber. This isn't disrespectful as she is inheriting a lightsaber that has no other clear claimant. Plus it makes sense from the perspective that having Obi-Wan energy on it pulls her to the light side. The, the sequel trilogy could then have properly made her Luke's apprentice in episode 7 and the equivalent of Luke in the sequel trilogy. This could have been good as Rey could have built her abilities within herself rather than rely on Palpatine to protect her in a harsh world. And so Luke ends up thwarting Darth Sidious plans again in such a way that he has actually turned the tables on what Emperor Palpatine was attempting to do to him and Vader in Episode 6. 
Additionally it could have been a useful way to explore the microbial world in the sense that jettisoning Palpatine from Ray for good could have involved the force on this level but it is personalized. Overcoming the Obi-Wan slash Palpatine issue within etc is a good struggle to overcome and internalizes the light slash dark theme. Having Force Ghost Anakin and Obi-Wan play a role in definitively severing Palpatine from Rey is a good way to heal their relationship too. As we just see them together as Force Ghosts at the end of Episode 6. Anybody else? Anybody else? Ben Solo slash Kylo Ren. Vision. Several years after The Force Awakens. Many have been documenting the issues with Kyle Ren's character. Such as the fact he starts off as being intimidating but becomes weakened as the film wears on. Making him unsuitable as an intimidating villain who needs to be overcome. Then there is the issue of being an emo crybaby and so forth. There were some good ideas however. The Vader mask is a good idea in relation to the pull to the dark side. A twin object was a Nekin's lightsaber as the pull to the light side. And so both are a good metaphor for the struggle occurring within. As Kylo Ren slash Ben Solo's arc moves to the light side he claims a Nekin's lightsaber and loses the mask. Having Snoke as Plagueis works as well. In terms of Ben Solo it works because where the force. Or the wills. Struck back so to speak against Plagueis and created Anakin in response to his midichlorian experiments creating life. Having a strong interest in turning the progeny would be part of Plagueis attempting to gain control of the situation. Have Plagueis masquerading as Snoke be something like Sauron as the necromancer in The Hobbit or perhaps more like the villain Anubis in Stargate SG-1. Anubis was a villain that was halfway between something of an ascended state and the physical realm. Given he managed to survive or quasi-survive, after dying at about the same time as Key gone, it makes sense. He would be opposed to Sidious as well as part of a different faction as well. And so would be opposed to Rey. This can make the relationship between Kylo and Rey more interesting than the Twilight nonsense we ended up with. For example, there's the evil potential of both reigning large parts of the galaxy as dark side users. For example coming together as descendants of Palatine and Vader. A bit like if Luke Skywalker had ever joined with Vader for example from a dark side perspective. But also the potential for them to both have a prominent role as light side users. In this case coming together as descendants of the Skywalkers and Kenobis. Having seen the issues the rule of two creates. Having Plagueis form a reformed Sith Order with the eradication of the rule of two would make some sense. Plus gives some distinct flavor to his Sith Order of the sequel trilogy. It also allows for the Knights of Ren to make sense and established a viable fighting force in opposition to Luke's new Jedi Order. Episode 9 should have seen the destruction of Plagueis which rounds off what was begun in Episode 1 and ties in nice. Leah's Plagueis was something of a phantom menace during that time period. While initially under the influence of Snoke as Vader was under Emperor Palpatine. It would have worked well for just as Luke redeemed their father and faced deep issues within himself in terms of the journey to that moment. And so as Leia got to grips with her Skywalker heritage. She would play a role in redeeming Kylo Ren to the light side and so go through something of a similar process to Luke in the original trilogy. Food for thought anyway. It is all academic now. The whole Disney trilogy looks like a dumpster fire that will not stand the test of time.